Hello, this is Dr. S. Nandagopalan. I'm going to talk about the double-ended queue as far as this session is concerned under data structures and applications subject for the third semester. Last class, we have talked about priority queues and then normal circular queues, you know, all types of queues. This is the last, uh, you know, topic under this queue uh, varieties of the types. So let me just quickly take you to the PPT so that uh, we can discuss about the double ended queue where the insertion and deletion is going to happen on either ends. Now recall, recall that we have uh, discussed uh, the normal queue where you can insert from rear and delete from front. But uh, uh, you know that kind of scenario may not be always useful, though in some applications it is still uh, used in normal kind of applications. But there are certain applications where this type of uh, insertion or deletion which could happen on either ends is going to be the uh, you know discussion topic today so let's just begin by explaining what exactly we mean by double ended queue now you can see here in this figure that normally insertion happens from the rear so this is this is the okay i'll just delete this so this one is our normal one delete from front you know this one and this one are the normal ones but now what we are going to do is that we will have uh, deletion from rear as well you can see here deletion normally happens front but we are allowing deletion to happen from the rear as well and insertion from front so this is also possible now so essentially when we talk about a queue like this so these dotted lines indicate that these are the extra elements which we could have you know for the entire kind of a queue so these thick lines indicate the current uh, set of elements like four elements in this case so we we if we have insertion for instance uh, from the front you know it's not rear it's the friend so it could grow in the left hand side now insertion could happen even on the rear so it could grow on the right side as well now that's what the dotted lines indicate because we we are not just talking about insertion at one end and deletion from the other end so the pointers here can move in either way we'll see what uh, kind of pointers we require how many pointers we require in order to do all these kinds of operations okay so let's try to understand with uh, two pointers here front and rear uh, again similar to the normal queue uh, but uh, you can see here the dotted lines again indicate that it could happen that insertion may happen here or insertion may happen here or deletion may happen here and deletion also can happen here. So adjustment of the pointers, movement of the pointers are very important. Supposing if I insert from the friend, for instance, the friend may have to go back. So all these uh, you know, confusions are there. Now that is the uh, point which we need to worry about. So let's now try to show how insertion takes place in a double-ended queue. So let's assume that you know 10, 20, 30 are the original uh, set of elements and assume that we would like to insert element number five in the friend. See, remember we have to show all these four operations, insert friend, in, delete friend, insert rear, delete rear, instead of two functions uh, in the earlier case, that is uh, uh, NQ and DQ. NQ for entering an element into the queue. Deletion, you know, DQ is to delete an element from the queue. So only two functions, but here it's four functions. So that's why we have to demonstrate 
the working of double ended queue by considering all these four scenarios. OK, so let's assume that we would like to insert element number five in the front. So front was pointing here originally. Now it should be moved back. Number one. Number two, element 40 is inserted rear. So this is purely insertion. Friend insertion, we have shown. This uh, bullet shows the insertion at the rear. End. So rear has to change. So 30 followed by, so let's say, new element is 40. So from the original configuration, assume that we would like to add or insert an element in the rear. So we get 40 in the rear. So rear pointer has to be advanced by one. Here, friend pointer could should be moved backwards. Now these are some of the uh, you know points which we need to consider will be write the algorithm. OK, next deletion. Right, so originally friend was pointing here. And I want to delete from friend. It's like a normal case. So I just uh, save this elemental value and advance my pointer by one. So element is deleted. Delete from rear. So this is rear deletion. So rear was pointing to 30 in the original configuration. So now when I delete, now you can see that rear has to be decremented. That means it should come back to this. So uh, from the original configuration, again 10, 20, 30, rear was pointing here. And uh, once we delete this from the rear, the pointer rear has to come back to this 20. So it should be decremented. So these are some of the points and exceptions as usual. Uh, when does the uh, queue, that is uh, double-ended queue becomes full and uh, what is underflow in the case of double-ended queue? OK, so that again we will show along with this insertion, uh, you know, uh, algorithm where we introduce a new kind of a variable called count. It's a global variable or you can pass it uh, to the function. So in this case, I am just showing it as a C function. Um, so directly you can execute. Uh, we will talk about all this execution of various data structures, especially under you know, this particular module two in, in later part of my lecture. OK, so now count indicates that how many elements are there in the queue at any point of time. And you can see here front is initialized to zero and for insertion. Friend from if from front can be shown like this. So let us assume that DQ is my uh, object or variable where it could be of type DQ. That means it could be a structure or an object if you are implementing let's say in C++ or any other object oriented program. So in this case it's a C or C++, so I could use it as a structure. So element to be inserted is X. OK, so if DQ count is equal to max, so straight away because you know this is a very easy method that count is a variable where whenever we insert either from front or from rear, the count is incremented, right? And uh, whenever an element is deleted either from front or from rear, the count value is decremented, which means that at any point of time, my count will give me what is the number of elements we have. I mean, total number of elements we have in the double ended queue. So if I declare an array, let's say for the double ended queue as maximum size, then I can compare it very easily with my current count value. So if it's equal to max, that means that I don't have space. I can just say that it is full. That means overflow. Otherwise, automatically it comes to this. And uh, as you can see, we are talking about front insertion. So again, <clears throat> we have to think of the one element case where supposing assume that there's only one element, uh, I mean the last element in the cube, which means that uh, the front pointer could become zero, in which case uh, I could uh, make the front pointer pointing to max minus one. So, and uh, otherwise I can just uh, add my element pointed by front and increment my count. So you can see here that uh, unlike the previous algorithms, 
we try to uh, you know add in <coughs> insert an element uh, as far as the front insertion is concerned directly <coughs> pointed by the front so i assume that dq is having a member called items which is nothing but an array so part of the item sorry part of the structure which is called as items and which is an array and uh, the index which is nothing but pointed by front so pointed by front i just added and as i said earlier once an element is added either from front or from rear we just increment the count so you can uh, see here supposing if we go with the uh, front insertion yeah so uh, element 5 is inserted at front so we have uh, if front when you decrement you know it's 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 not uh, uh, done in this case you know if it is equal to 0 say i'm going to decrement this front value and i'm going to add the element that's what it's uh, shown here you should decrement front and then add the element now after decrementing suppose if this becomes max minus 1 you know if that front value uh, is equal to max minus 1 then front uh, sorry uh, uh, when when this becomes 0 uh, that means it's the last one front pointer has reached the front of as far as the front portion is concerned so that has reached to the uh, you know zero location in the array so in which case we will just uh, uh, reset it to max minus 1 front pointer and uh, so x is <clears throat> now added pointed by front because we have decremented already and the count is incremented now deletion from uh okay delete 30 is deleted which means it was originally pointing to 30 now we have to decrement okay we have to decrement rear but again we have to take the exception cases so if the count is zero of course it's underflow so we can just return minus 1 indicating that it is uh, you know not having any elements you are trying to delete an element uh, from the double ended queue where there are no elements as such now otherwise uh, because uh, uh, rear pointer actually points to the filled element so you can first save this element pointed by rear and decrement this you know this point so this is a case which need to be taken as usual like previous case uh, you know after decrementing rear if it is equal to 0 again rear pointer is set to max minus 1 so that is the uh supposing if i have declared 5 then it is set to 4 that means the maximum value minus 1 as far as the c array is concerned okay so that means that we have uh, successfully deleted uh, the element from the rear and you can return t that means that saved uh, element because we need to worry about that uh, both front and uh, rear pointers you know they keep moving depending upon whether you are inserting from front or deleting from front rear you know all that so similarly we can actually show how the uh, you know uh, rear insertion which is same as uh, see why i have not shown here the other two functions is basically because rear insertion is same like the previous one except the count and uh, maybe i will talk about this in the program straight away and uh, uh, normally the front deletion is uh, same as the previous case that means normal queue and hence we don't need to talk about that here so that's the reason why we have two functions which are new as far as the double ended queue is concerned that is front insertion and rear deletion rear insertion and front deletion these two are the old for the normal queue case okay so this is uh, the double ended queue full program 
and it's working will be shown live. That means using Visual Studio Code uh, in my later part of the lecture. So we will not waste time on this now. So we will move on to now the another very, very interesting uh, topic called as maze problem uh, where this particular problem is a bit complex, so I'll take little, uh, you know, elaborate explanation here, and uh, you should be able to cope up with me if you follow the slides properly. Okay. What is a maze problem? Okay, I'll, I'll explain this maybe with uh, another diagram as I've shown just now in the next slide, but. Uh, uh, in the real world kind of scenario. So first let's understand the problem itself. Right, so what exactly we mean by maze problem? You would have seen, you know, in, in movies, Hollywood movies, and uh, in other puzzle solving kind of environment where uh, this is something like uh, uh, a puzzle itself, uh, which is called as popularly known as uh, maze problem. Okay, now this is the, original uh, diagram which normally people show that assume that we have a, a, a pattern something like this where we have uh, you know the thick uh, lines here are called as the walls and these white ones you know the openings are the 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 path which the rat can actually move okay so this is the entry point for the rat and this is the exit point. Try to understand the problem first. So we are given a board or a scenario or a framework where we have walls and we have openings. See a lot of uh, computer games also you would have seen something like this, but this is a very old popular game. Okay, now may or the rat enters here and you should be able to show the path for this maze to come out from this exit point. Like for example, it can enter here, it can go like this, like, okay, I'll just uh, draw this for you. Okay, I you know. It could start like this. Supposing it goes like this. I mean, it takes a path like this. And let's say it goes like this. It goes like this. It goes like this. And because these openings, it can actually move. I'm just showing some random path here. OK. Something like this. If it's intelligent, probably it can come out. On the other hand, if it would have taken some other path instead of this, let's take, you know, instead of going like this, if it had come like this, then it would see a dead end. Now under this scenario, what it should do, it should actually go back. Now this is where uh, backtracking algorithm, which you will study in next semester, or recursive kind of uh, methodology, which we have. Because, for example, it has taken a, a path, something like this, instead of, going, instead of going like this. So it has come here and it has seen a dead end. Now it would have to go back to the same point, not to the starting point. It should go back to the most recent one where it has taken a different path. Okay. See, there are two paths available. Instead of going like this, it has taken a, this blue. So after seeing some dead end, it could happen at any point of time after going through so many, uh, you know, directions. So what happens here? It has to go back to this and then try out some other options. If it has, if it doesn't have, then, you know, there may not be any path also. But we assume that there is some path available. If at all, it goes in a proper way. So that's exactly what we are going to solve. So what is the problem now? We to summarize, given this board, okay, the, the walls and the openings, 
that entry point is given and exit point is also given. So your job is to inform or find out the path for the rack into this and then come out into the exit point. So this whole thing, the board can be transformed or modeled in terms of a matrix where zero indicates that any cell with zero value indicates that it can move. That means the opening. Wherever it is one, it's a wall. You can see it's shaded, you know, gray shaded. So it cannot go into that direction. For instance, assume that it starts something like this, this location, and it can go like this because zero, zero. It cannot go like this because there is a one, and it cannot go like this because it is one. So it has to go like this, zero, zero, zero. So instead of going like this, though it's a zero, it's just taking this path. So we have to work out that or it's, instead of going like this. So there are possibilities that it can go left, it can go up, it can go down, it can go right, it can go diagonally. That's what we're going to show in the next slide, that what are the possible directions a rat can move. So in this case, you can see that zero, 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 it has come out. This assuming that this is my exit point given. So given this, you know, uh, five by five, yeah, five rows and five columns, and certain cells are ones and certain cells are zero. One indicates that it cannot move. Zero means it can move. So your job is to find out the exact path by which the rat can actually enter and exit. So I hope that the problem is clear. It's not the solution. It's only the problem. OK, now let's move on to some more basic points. So uh, we are trying to now build the solution process for which we need to understand certain things like as I said, assume that X is the. Given current uh, position at any point of time for the rat. OK, so this is my current position. OK, I just erase this. OK, from this current uh, position. This current position. Uh, rat can move uh, in the upward direction, which is north, I'll call it, or right, east, west, south, northwest, northeast, southeast and south. So there are how many? Eight possible directions uh, to which the rat can actually move. Eight directions. These are possibilities. So supposing if there is a one here, it cannot move. Supposing if there is a one here, it cannot move. If there is a zero, it can move. If it's a zero, it can move. So there are some possibilities. When in, out of eight uh, possible directions, it may have three zeros and four, uh, sorry, five ones depends. So the rat can be at any position. If X represents the current position, then it can move all possible eight. So these are represented like this. Now, further in terms of our array, a two dimensional array, we will try to translate these movements instead of these north south. You know that's not going to help us in, in building an algorithm. So what we do is we will translate this in terms of the array index. So I indicates the row index, J indicates the. So this is I, maybe 0, 1, 2 or 1, 2, 3. This is J, right? OK, so if this is my current position, I comma J, right? Uh, rat can move towards right, supposing. So I remain same, same row, but column is incremented. Now same row, but this way left side means J is incremented because if this is one, two, three, this is again one, two, three. Obviously, if this is my current position, left means the column has to be changed, decrement here, increment J plus one because two becomes three here, two becomes one. Similarly, if there is a possibility of movement up north direction, that means row is decremented. You can see here row value from 2 to 1. That means I is incremented. J becomes same. Column remains same. So similarly, if this way, 
supposing diagonally row has to be incremented column also has to be incremented so from 2 it becomes 3 here again 2 becomes 3 so i plus 1 j plus 1 so that's it so we can translate the moment of the rat in terms of the array indexes that's what this figure shows so let me erase this so i think that's the explanation given here so we will call this array as maze 0 comma 0 that is maze is the complete array and uh, supposing if it's at this point you know it can move this way if it is 0 it can move this way if it is 0 it can move this way if it is 0 N not every time uh, you know the rat will get all eight possible directions to move because if it is on one side like this, you know, end or the corner, then it has only three possible moments. You can see here east, south and southeast. So only three possible cases. OK, so that also we have to identify. So uh, that we will show in the next slide. So in order to design an algorithm, it is easier to refer to the predefined lookup table because now we do not know when the maze is here, whether we have three every time instead of calculating it, we can readily get this information from a pre stored table, which we call it as a lookup table. So how does it look like? It looks like something like this. So supposing if we, uh, you know, I have my directions, which is specified as 0, 1, 2, 3. So it's indicated here. 0 means north, uh, you know, 2 means it is east, 6 means west, and this is south. You can see south. So north, south, east, and west. Diagonal, again, northeast, you know, all that. So each direction is numbered because we are going to store this in a structure, and uh, we could actually find out whether the rat can move or not. So based upon these directions, so we will define or declare a structure where we have uh, two uh, members here called vertical and horizontal. So vertical, you can see here minus one, minus one, and uh, horizontal, no movement, that is zero. And supposing if you're talking about two, direction two, you can see here uh, vertical is zero and uh, horizontal is one. So we can easily the three values minus one zero one uh, uh, because that's what uh, you know the moment actually shows uh, rat moment in order to make sure that for example you can see here it's uh, easy to understand here third one that is this one you can see here both vertical and horizontal should move that means get incremented that's why both vertical and horizontal is one one on the other hand Let's take zero that is north from this point. North, you can see here vertically it is minus one, you know, and horizontally it is zero. So one is not moment, no moment, and another one is a moment. So this i minus one or uh, j plus one, j minus one, all these things are actually indicated with respect to these structure members vertical and horizontal uh, so that's what is called as offsets and uh, this entire thing is going to be stored in terms of an array of structure where move is the variable so move of zero has two members minus one and zero because remember the movement of the rat is not just one direction it is two directions which we need to specify it's a uh, like longitude and latitude like we normally location in, in mobile phones, uh, you know, we normally talk about longitude and latitude. So both are important. So similarly here, rat movement is not just one direction, but we need both the direction, vertical and horizontal. So we need uh, that information uh, depending upon the directional value. So where is the direction? Mu of zero will give me the direction zero. Mu of one will give me the direction one and so on. So once we get all this information stored, 
in the form of a lookup table like this, uh, there's nothing but uh, you know initialized uh, values because it's not going to change. Uh, so depending upon the current uh, position of the rat, given its i comma j values in the array, I can uh, easily find out which direction it has possibility to move and how much offset I should provide. So the offset values will be taken from this move array of structures. So if I want to move up, I can easily know that how much to decrease or increase my i and j value. So basically the movement of the rat on the array is actually calculated by using this table. So we'll show further how is it done. OK, so these are the initial values, maximum rows, number of rows, uh, six by six array. So here I think we have shown three by three. So let's assume uh, that it is a six by six array. So what is the starting position of the rat row column? Maybe one comma one. And what is the exit? Six comma six. So I mean it, it could change. You can give these values different. You can read it from the keyboard as well, but but we are just fixing these values, you know, starting and uh, exit point and the size of the maze board. OK, now we will try to understand how to calculate the next position for the rat to move using the lookup table. So how to calculate the position of the rat from the current position? current uh, position of the rat. So that is assume that the current location of rat is some row comma because remember rat keeps moving, so we have to move it. How to move from one position to the other? That's exactly what we are going to calculate here. So let's assume that the current position is some row and some you know column. For example, I can assume that this is my current one, so three here, one, two, three, four, five, five by five array I have taken just for demonstration purpose. So the current position may be, you know, one, two, three, three comma three. Okay. Now after finding, I mean, after getting this value, say current position, now there could be several possibilities, like eight possibilities or less than that. Now, where to move this rat to the next position? So, how to calculate this next row and next column? So, this one. How to calculate that? So, next row can be calculated as current row plus, you know, from the lookup table with respect to the direction and its vertical because row value has to be obtained. Now, column value. Is the horizontal one, okay? The moment. So from the current column, I can just find out what is my uh, next position in terms of the column value. Okay, let us let us uh, assume uh, some sample data so that you can easily understand. So let's assume that may zero comma represent the top left corner as I've already mentioned. That is not one two three. But let us assume that it starts from 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3. So we have current row to 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, right? So instead of 1, 2, 3, I am just assuming that it is from 0. It starts from 0. Something like, like CRA again, right? So 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2. So it's 2, comma 2. You can see current row 2, comma 2. What is the current direction? It is zero position. And the next position of the rat using this formula, next row is nothing but what is the current row? Two. Then current direction is zero. And what is the vertical value? If you look up, uh, see the lookup table for zero, for zero, you have vertical minus one and zero. So you can see here vertical is minus one. Okay. You can see here it is minus one. This is the vertical we are trying to find out. So essentially it becomes one and uh, column it is zero. So it becomes two. So one comma two. So one is row that is this one. One comma 
two zero one two. That is this one. So it has to move up. Now we are trying to uh, find out all positive. Remember why this current uh, direction is zero? Because we would always start looking for the possibility of the next position for the rat to move. We start from north. See like this, so we go like this. You can see numbering. Is done in the same fashion. So we start looking for this first, next this, next this, next this and so on until we reach here. That means if we can move here, we will move. If we cannot try for this direction, if we cannot move again to this, there could be one that is a wall. Then you try for the second direction and so on. So that's exactly what we have done here. Now current uh, position is 2 comma 2 and the next position is uh, uh, 1 comma 2 because we have started from north that is 0. So what happens from this? I am getting 1 comma 2 that is this is one sec first row and this is the second column 0 1 2. So what I'm seeing here is a 1. So this is not possible to move. So I should try for the next one that is current dot direction is equal to 1 for the same current position. So now the current position of the rat is 1 comma 2 which indicate that it is moved to north and if it is legitimate which means that it should have a zero. OK, if it doesn't. Right, if it doesn't, then we have to try for the next direction. OK, now what we do is in case if we cannot move, then we will store this return address in the stack because it doesn't mean that supposing assume that I try for the next and I get uh, a zero there, I can move it, but I may go to a dead end and I'm have to come back to this position and try for the next direction. So that's the idea. So out of all the eight directions, any directions fail, I need to store that in the stack so that I can try other possibilities after coming back. So it's it's highly complex recursive mechanism. So the solution process goes like this. If I get a zero, I move to the next position and uh, current position of the rat becomes that. And again, try for uh, um, try for the all possibilities. If anything, I get zero. Again, go there. And by luck, if everything is zero, whatever the directions I'm getting, I could possibly reach. So, at the uh, in the process, I should check whether I have reached my exit point. So, every time you have to check whether that exit point, you know, which we have given as an initialization, see this one. The row column value is equal to the current, uh, uh, you know, rat position, so that you can wind up. Because exiting from the recursion also is very important. Okay. Now what we do is we will not show the algorithm here because that's not part of your uh, uh, this one, uh, you know, syllabus. However. Uh, I have actually written a program for uh, implementing, you know, based upon this concept, I implemented the maze uh, complete, uh, you know, maze problem, the solution for the maze problem, and I will execute that later and show you, um, you know, in, in a simpler way. Like uh, it's not a graphical one; it is just like. Uh, you know, movement can be shown the cells with star, a character star. Zero indicates movement, one indicates no movement or wall, and star indicate the path. So because we need to find or show the path of the movement for the right, for example, like this. So how do you show? So instead of the zero, I put a star, 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 you know, all that. So I'll I'll show you that execution later on. But otherwise, the solution process is good enough. We will not go into the detailed, uh, you know, algorithm, etc. But uh, for the benefit of the people who are interested in knowing how is it executed after implementing it in C or C++, I think I should be able to show you in the later class. So let's not uh, deviate from the current topic. That's the idea. So we are just talking about only the concepts here. 
I hope that the viewers has understood this. Now let's move on to what is known as multiple stacks. Now in a given array, we have seen how a single stack can be uh, you know, implemented by using just one pointer called one stack pointer called top. That means push and pop uh, from the same end. See, top is incremented and elements are added. And for deletion, delete pointed by top and then decrement top. So this is very simple uh, and easy to understand. But suppose you assume that we are given an array where we should have or accommodate multiple stacks, more than one stack. It could be any number. So how do we do it? OK, so we need to accommodate many stacks. And uh, since we have multiple stacks, obviously we will have multiple tops. But in this case, one single pointer may not be sufficient like top or a stack pointer, but we need also the bottom because remember, or don't get confused, it is not that each stack has got a different container or an array. What we are going to do is we are going to you know, implement many stacks in one array. So we need to find out the segmented portion of each stack. You know, single memory is divided into segments. That means each segment is dedicated for a particular stack, the ith stack, like that. So I think a diagram will help you to understand. So let's assume uh, certain things here. Maximum memory is the total memory size. Supposing, uh, you know, if I have uh, 15 locations allocated, three stacks or so five uh, uh, locations for each stack, something like that. So maximum memory indicates the single array size. Maximum number of stacks, how many stacks you want to implement. It may not be divisible, so whatever is left out will be allocated to the last stack. N is the number of stacks, of course. So maximum strike for each uh, uh, stack. That means maximum memory is divided by N. And uh, top now is not a scalar, now it's a vector because every stack in this case should have a stack pointer. Every stack should have a stack point, so we need an array. Okay. Similarly, as I said earlier, we cannot manage this with single pointer here, but we need one more pointer called B, which is bottom of the stack. Because it's an array, <clears throat> we can store both. Uh, sorry, we can store the bottom index of each and every stack. So B of zero indicate the zero stack bottom value and top of zero indicate the zero stack. What is the value of that particular stacks index? So these two are arrays indicating that for each stack we can store both uh, top pointer and bottom pointer. Again, a figure will help you to understand. Uh, finally, of course, items array, uh, actual items to be stored. Yeah, so now you can easily under whatever we have said in the previous slide, now it's shown in the form of a diagram. So carefully observe this. We have <coughs> one, two, three, four, five stacks. Starting from zero, we have five stacks. How many locations? That is maximum memory is zero to 14. That is 15. So 15 divided by five is three. That is the maximum size for each stack. <coughs> okay. Right. So each stack should have both <coughs> top pointer and bottom point. Right. So for instance, this stack, stack zero, has the top pointer and bottom, but top of zero and bottom of zero. And similarly, top of one and bottom of one, top of two and bottom of one. And this arrow indicates that the stack grows 
from lower side to the upper side. For example, top of zero will be incremented and element will be added. So initially it is pointing to minus one. And initially top one is pointing to two. Actually it's start once uh, area starts from three because it's pointing to now one less. So that's it. similar to the first stack. So called first stack starts from zero. So the my top pointer should point to one less, which is minus one. So I increment first this and then push. So for example, now it's pointing to minus one. Uh, add one to this, which is zero. So now top of zero will point to zero. Add one more element, then it will be again top of zero will go here. Bottom will remain as it is here in this position only because bottom should indicate, bottom pointer should indicate which is the bottom position because we need to contain our elements within this boundary of every stack because same memory is, uh, is managed for storing multiple stacks. Okay, now I'll show you how the figure will look like after filling some elements. Okay. So that's whatever is explained uh, is given here. So under, uh, you know, overflow for instance, or uh, empty position, all can easily be shown. You know, when, uh, when the condition top of five plus one is bottom, that is uh, minus one plus one, sorry, plus, yeah, minus one plus one is zero. So both top of zero and bottom of zero is point. I mean, it has the same value, which means that it is empty. Similarly, this one. So top of one plus one is three, so which is the value for bottom of one. So that's what I said. Uh, initially, the top pointer will be one less than the bottom. Okay, so you increment top and then start adding. So bottom remains error. So 15 locations divide by five, you will get uh, three for each stack. OK, so how do we initialize uh, top of zero minus one is indicated bottom of zero is zero and uh, starting from one. We can just use the simple formula for all the stacks. So n number of stacks we have starting from one, both top and bottom can be easily, you know, in, uh, you know, initialized by using this. For example, maximum is 15 divided by five, three, three into one, one for the first stack. You know, so it's one and one less like that. So top will be one less than the bottom. So that's why you get minus one here, right? So since top of I always points to your filled location, the initial value of stack of zero is minus one, two that we have already explained. Yeah, so this is the, uh, you know, diagram which shows after filling some elements. So how do we show this? Uh, as I said earlier, top of zero was actually pointing to minus one. Now after adding two elements, let's take that I have added 10 and 11 to first stack, that is stack zero. So top of zero was minus one. Now it becomes zero, then it becomes one because two elements are added. Bottom of zero remains same. So this is the pointers. So top of zero points to the top of the stack. Bottom of zero points to the bottom of the stack. So simple. So given the stack number, I can easily extract or pop the element, uh, topmost element from this stack based upon top of zero. Okay, next. This stack is filled with some elements full actually. So uh, top of two, sorry. Yeah, top of two is uh, pointing to this five. Now becomes six, seven, eight. Now it's almost full. You can see here uh, exception cases can easily be calculated that whether it has come to the uh, full case or not. So pushing and popping can be done in a similar fashion, but given the stack number, stack ID is very important. So the push operation can be designed uh, similar to the one, but we need an extra input called stack ID, obviously, because which stack you want to insert. See 10 I want to insert in stack 0 and 30 I want to insert in stack 2. So that's the idea. Right. So we have uh, which stack the user wants to push. Secondly, overflow, you know, is not same as the previous one, obviously. 
it's not max minus one. See, overflow for this stack may be different from the overflow for this stack, right? So unless we come to the, I mean, any any particular stack, its top point uh, when it reaches to the bottom of this next stack, probably it's very easy. So that's what we are going to show you. OK, assume that we have pushed two elements uh, into the stack zero and three elements into the stack two. All the remaining stacks are still empty. And oh yeah, coming to overflow and underflow. So what is overflow? How do we calculate this? I mean, how do we find this after calculation? So supposing let's assume the stack two is already overflowing and uh, any any new element to be added in stack two should result in an overflow. So when top of i stack, that is second stack, is equal to bottom of i plus one minus one, that's what I said, you know, i stack, we are talking about second stack. So what is the top pointer of second? Top pointer of second is eight. Okay. I will see whether this calculation tallies. And bottom of i plus one, so that is third one, is actually three. Three value is nine. Nine minus one is eight, which means it's, that's what I said. That if top of any stack is equal to the bottom pointer of the next stack, which means that we have come to the uh, maximum size for the stack. You can see very easily here. Top of this current stack is actually uh, eight, and uh, bottom pointer of the next stack is actually nine. So that means this has grown. No, this. Stack two has grown and reached to the top. See, this is not at grow. So top when it moves here, obviously it's grown full like that. OK, underflow. So if this condition fails, then you can push the element after incrementing the top point of the eighth stack. Underflow, <clears throat> right. So we have uh, to check what top of I plus. That's uh, I think we have already said uh, very easily. Um, Initial, for example, we'll take this. So top of I plus one, that is 11 plus one is 12. So if both are equal, that means it's empty as the bottom pointer. When this is false, there are elements in the stack. Otherwise, it is uh, underflow. That means no elements are there. So we can easily uh, pop the element provided this condition is false. Right, so we have in a similar fashion multiple queues. So same array we have. Uh, we have uh, maximum size as uh, 12 in this case 0 to 11, 12. And we shall assume here again four queues, Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3, etc. I, again, I'll show you, I forgot to mention that uh, you may be wondering the algorithms for this is same, you know, for the multiple stack I'm talking about, but how to actually manage uh, to write all this. You have to modify the existing algorithm of push and pop with stack ID. So I'll show you that again in the form of a program, C program separately. Right, so multiple queues, uh, same array, like uh, one full size that is 12 and you have four queues and we have front pointers and the rear pointers again with an array. So each queue has got both front pointers and rear pointer. And uh, so items, of course, is the actual elements to be stored in this array. And uh, starting from zero to maximum size or max size minus one is to store the data elements of all the queue elements. So it's, it's almost same, except that for front and rear, we need arrays because it's not just one queue. We have multiple queues. So this is for four queues, it's indicated. And uh, similar to multiple stack, initialization is shown here. For the first one is again front is zero, similar to normal queue, zero and the rear is minus one. For the rest of the queues, you can easily do the same fashion like we did earlier, no? into i and minus one. So there uh, in stack, multiple stack, it is top and bottom. Here it is front and rear. OK, to summarize uh, uh, this part of the stack and queue. Normal stack, dynamic, multiple stack. When you talk about queues, 
different uh, varieties of queues normal queue circular queue priority queue double ended queue and dynamic and multiple queues so i think in summary these are the topics which we have discussed under this each topic the algorithm etc program we will discuss in the next session now thanks for watching and uh, we will meet again thank you thank you again